Newark Baptist Church, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit guide and direct us into all truth tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are, again, continuing our series called Understanding the Jews. This is now lesson number 170, and tonight's lesson is entitled King Solomon, Part 6. So last week, we had been following the young King Solomon as he returned to Jerusalem after he had an amazing encounter with God, an encounter that occurred in a dream while he was at the city of Gibeon to make sacrifice. And in that dream, among other things, God had promised to give Solomon more wisdom than any other natural man had or would ever possess. And upon his arrival in Jerusalem, Solomon was immediately presented with an opportunity to test the scope of that newfound wisdom. Two women had come before his royal court to seek judgment in a matter of great contention between them. So I want to look at that account in 1 Kings chapter 3, so we'll go to the scriptures. 1 Kings 3, 16 through 18. <clears throat> Scripture reads, Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king, and stood before him. And the one woman said, O my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house. And I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also. And we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. So let's stop here for just a moment. I want to do that so we can consider the problem that Solomon was going to have. Before he even hears what the issue is, he has learned from this woman that he's not going to get any help in resolving it. Under Mosaic law, found back in Deuteronomy 17.6, it's stated that the truth of a matter can be established at the mouth of two or three witnesses. But in verse 18, we learned what? There are no witnesses. King Solomon will be on his own. So let's continue with what actually happened and to what it is that Solomon is going to be requested to make a ruling. 1 Kings 3, and now we're going to read verses 19 through 22. The scripture reads, And this woman's child died in the night, because she overlaid it. And she arose at midnight, and took my son from beside me, while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom, and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I arose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. Now whenever we hear a story like this, we're pretty quick to identify it as a case of he said, she said, right? Well, of course, in 
In this instant case, it would be she said, she said. And nobody likes to get in the middle of one of those. But Solomon listens until the facts of the case have all been presented. And as many judges are accustomed to doing, he then restates the matter that he has before him so that he knows that everybody is aware that he's got the issue right. So let's go to 1 Kings 3.23. Scripture reads, Then said the king, The one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is dead. And the other say, Nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. So now everybody knows that the king has understanding of the issue. He announces right away a remedy. Let's look at 1 Kings 3, 24 through 26. The scripture reads, if you'll go back to 24, 26, Brock. There it is. Thank you very much. The scripture reads, and the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one and half to the other. Then spake the child, I'm sorry, then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king. For her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. So here we have the king's judgment and the reaction of both of the women. The first woman is horrified at the prospect of the child being cut in half. And she promptly offers to give up her claim in order to spare the child's life. And then we have the second woman. And this woman is apparently satisfied with the king's remedy. She seems to be okay to split the child and she urges the court to carry out on that order. Now the response of the first woman is understandable. But what do we do about the second woman? Now in my former working life, before retirement, I had been the chief advocate in scores of hearings. And I cannot recall a single case where either party was offered a complete settlement of their claim. Everything that they were looking for and turned it down. That's exactly what this second woman has done. Her adversary <clears throat> has just withdrawn her claim leaving her with a total victory. She's now free to leave with the living child. And that, after all, is why she came there in the first place. What in the world was she thinking? What explanation can we ascribe to her sudden change of position? I mean, talk about somebody doing a 180. This takes the cake. And if the scriptures gave an explicit reason for her actions, well, I would gladly share it with you. But there really isn't one. The best possible explanation goes to the woman's desire to please the king. She may have reasoned that the king would be very impressed that she was so loyal to him 
that she would be supportive of the ruling he had just made, even if it meant sacrificing her own son. Well, if that was her thinking, she badly misjudged character of her king. Let's go to 1 Kings 3, 27 and 28. The scripture reads, Then the king answered, <clears throat> and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged. And they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. So upon observing the response that both of these women gave, King Solomon countermanded his original order. And he awarded the child to the woman who took the risk of challenging the king, challenging, challenging his order. She would rather give the child up than see him harmed. And it is said, and we read that in the last verse, as a result of Solomon's judgment, all Israel feared him. Fear as in ultimate respect. And recognized that he possessed wisdom that bordered on the divine. All because of this one judgment. The question becomes, why? Surely. It wasn't because Solomon, Solomon was able to weigh the reactions of these two women. The reaction they had to his proposed remedy, it could not have been that. How much superior wisdom did that really take? I would say little to none. Think about it. You have two women both claiming to be the mother of a helpless child. And that child comes under the threat of a horrific death. One woman offers to give up the child and pleads to spare the child. The other is prepared to see the child die, irrespective as to whether either one of them gains possession. Now I ask you, in all sincerity, is that a tough call? If any of us have even the slightest understanding of maternal love, I dare say that every single one of us would have easily come to the same conclusion that Solomon did. And that surely would apply to everybody that was present in Solomon's court that day. If there was a vote, they would have been unanimous. So again, I ask you, where is the great wisdom in this? Well, the answer is this. Solomon's wisdom is not found in his judgment of the real mother's reaction to his proposed remedy. It's found in the proposal itself. Let's rewind to the beginning. At the outset, Solomon knew that there were no witnesses to this incident. That means that he could not establish the truth on the basis of witness testimony. Neither was there sufficient circumstantial evidence on which he could rely. Didn't appear to be any. There was only the competing accounts of the two women before him. And those two accounts were completely opposite to one another. 
What does that mean? It means that Solomon had only one element of jurisprudence upon which he could rely. What was it? It was the credibility of the two witnesses. That was all he had. And the genius of Solomon was how, in an instant, he devised a test to measure the credibility of these two women, who both claimed to be the real mother of the child in question. Now, I've already covered how I believe that all of us would have been able to accurately gauge the reaction of these two women. The response that each of them had to the test that Solomon had put before them. But let me ask you this. What about that test? The test itself. Who among us would have come up with that test? And how could we have done it? on essentially the spur of the moment. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I can at least answer for myself. I wouldn't have dreamed of such a proposal in a million years. Would you? There's just no way. Now, we are all so very familiar with this story. We've heard it told since we were children. And for that reason, it has lost a lot of its shock value. But if we were back there at the time, Solomon's proposal would have set us back in our seat. Something like that would have never entered our minds. But having just listened to each woman give her side of the events, Solomon was instantly able to determine what method would bring the truth to the surface. It was a ghastly proposal. But somehow, Solomon knew that he would never have to execute it. Solomon had picked something up during the testimony of these two women, possibly as subtle as their demeanor. And with the help of God, he identified the right test. And he reasoned within himself that the real mother would quickly make herself known. So weighing and interpreting the individual responses of the women was the easy part. Anybody could have done that. It was the test that was brilliant. For two other people, that same test may not have worked, may have needed a different test. But for these two, it was the right one. So understandably, those in attendance in the court that day were amazed. Here they saw two petitioners come into court with a matter of great importance, namely, the permanent custody of a male infant. And within the matter of a few minutes, and without the benefit of any witnesses, Solomon was able to render a verdict that was both just and accurate. Now, this is where we need to recall something that we learned back when David was, a, was a king, and we studied about this. If you remember, David's son Absalom was successful in stealing the hearts of the people because, remember, he sat in the gate, and what did he do? He listened to their dissatisfaction, stories regarding the verdicts that they were receiving when they brought their cases to the king. First of all, 
David himself was not personally hearing most of those cases, perhaps none of them. He had been delegating that responsibility to other people, and they were not always the cream of the crop. And the people did not think that they were receiving outcomes that were fair and just. So much so that they were willing to follow Absalom in his rebellion against David. But now, under Solomon, they're seeing a refreshing change. Number one, Solomon is personally sitting in judgment. He's not delegating, even in a case involving two harlots, a case he could have easily passed off to a lesser or a lower official. And on top of that, the people have now been given a sample of what they can expect from their new king, an example of his very sound judgment Verdicts that no one could complain about. Verdicts that instilled the people with confidence that real justice was being dispensed. Justice proceeding from real wisdom. So much so that in verse 28, it says that the people came to fear Solomon. Again, fear as in respect. Respect for his God-given ability. Oh, and that is exactly where the people thought Solomon's wisdom was coming from. And if that is truly what the people believed, oh, then that problem with dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction with the court system, the one that had previously plagued the nation, well, that was gone dispensed with. Solomon had not just eliminated his political enemies. We talked about that. He now was successful in uniting all Israel behind him. The people had a king that they could believe in. And with Solomon's reputation being firmly established, both inside and outside of the nation, it led to a period of prosperity that would never again be equal. And our Bible spells out that circumstance around the middle of chapter 4. So I want to leap forward for a minute just to pick that up. One verse in 1 Kings chapter 4, and it'll be verse 20. Scripture reads, Judah and Israel were many as the sand which is by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and making merry. The people became many. Prior to this, that was not nearly as evident. From the time that Israel first asked for a king until the time that Solomon became king, Israel had been engaged in one war after another. War after war after war. And those wars caused the loss of thousands upon thousands of fighting men. Men who were of marrying age. And we've studied many of those previous wars in this series. Needless to say, those many men who fell in battle did not have the opportunity to produce the offspring that they would have. The golden age under King Solomon was the first time that there was an extended period of peace. No wars, and hence no loss of young soldiers. And because of that, the nation of Israel experienced what we would call a population explosion. I myself am a baby boomer. I was born in those years right after World War II. 
when America experienced an unprecedented increase in the birth rate, an explosion of babies. And way back in ancient Israel, they had an explosion of their own. And along with that explosion came a tremendous increase in the need for goods and services. And accordingly, national productivity and international commerce began to grow to meet the higher demand. Coupled with the fact that there was tremendous wealth pouring into the country from Israel's neighbors in the way of presents and tributes. The net result of all this activity was that the nation entered into a period of great prosperity. Prosperity such as they had never known. To the point where it is described for us back in verse 20. They were eating, drinking, and making merry. They were living the high life. In our own country, we would call it living the American dream. Well, back in Solomon's time, it would have been living the Israelite dream. Things had never been better. So, time for a pause. This seems to be a good time to connect a future event with verse 20. An incident that will provide an opportunity to observe one of the many bad sides of human nature. I'm not strictly talking about the reign of Solomon, but about a complaint that fell at the feet of his son, Rehoboam. But it was a complaint that did have its origin during the reign of Solomon. And for that, we need to go way up to chapter 12. So I want to do that now. We're going to read the first four verses of that chapter. 1 Kings 12, 1 through 4. Scripture reads, And Rehoboam went to Shechem. For all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass, when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and called him. And Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore, Make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us, lighter, and we will serve thee. So I think most of you are familiar with what's going on here. Solomon's son Rehoboam has succeeded him as the new king of Israel. And he now has this delegation of tribes headed up by Jeroboam, who have come to him to present a petition for his consideration. And they spell it out in verse 4. They complain that his father David had laid heavy and grievous burdens and yokes upon them during his reign. And they didn't like it. But, if Rehoboam would agree to ease up on that burden, they would in turn agree to support him as the new king. So whenever this account is read or preached, it's inevitable that the focus is placed on the ill-advised response of the young Rehoboam. And there is unanimous consent that his response was not very wise. He could have and should have 
answered much better than he did. But part of that focus on Rehoboam's response goes to our almost automatic acceptance that the complaint which this delegation raised was meritorious. But was it? The scriptures do not support the veracity of those complaints. The only thing that this delegation had going for them was that God had predetermined before Rehoboam ever came to the throne that his kingdom would be split. Ten tribes represented in that delegation by Jeroboam were going to leave. And only Judah and Benjamin were going to remain with Rehoboam. The complaints themselves, they were just a flimsy pretext for Jeroboam to get what he wanted. So let's take a hard look at this complaint, or complaints, plural. The grievous burden that is mentioned is attached to two things, heavy taxation and forced labor. Those two. The grievous yoke being taxation. And the grievous service being forced labor. When these two charges are examined in the light of Scripture, it turns out that neither one of them holds up. First of all, there was military subscription, yes, but that was nothing new. Both Saul and David had raised armies. That was no shock. It was just as the prophet Samuel had told the people in advance at the time they requested a king to rule over them. And furthermore, the terms of the service that Solomon instituted were not at all grievous. If anything... The absence of war during Solomon's reign would have made their service time much less grievous. Now, the idea of forced labor, apart from military service, would have brought up images of slavery in Egypt, something that nobody would have wanted. But the civil service that Solomon instituted was nothing of the sort. When Israelites served King Solomon in the building projects, they were only assigned to the lightest jobs and or they were not doing any physical labor at all. They were instead acting as supervisors over those people who were not Israelites. They were strangers in the land, people who the Israelites were not able to drive out, or people who were captives as a result of previous wars. Let's look at 1 Kings 5, 13 through 14. The scripture reads, And King Solomon raised a levy out of all Israel. And the levy was 30,000 men. And he sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month by courses. A month they were in Lebanon, and two months at home. And Adoniram was over the levy. So Solomon raised 30,000 men out of Israel to work in Lebanon. But look at their work schedules. One month on and two months off till the project was complete. That is not a grievous work schedule. And it's certainly not the schedule of a bond servant. And the next two verses after this shed a little more light on the situation. So I want to go there now. First Kings chapter 5. Verses 15 and 16. The scripture reads, 
And Solomon had threescore and ten thousand that bear burdens, and fourscore thousand hewers in the mountains, beside the chief of Solomon's officers, which were over the work, three thousand and three hundred, which ruled over the people that wrought in the work. So after we read about the levy out of all Israel, that 30,000, we see in verse 15 a different group of laborers. We see that in addition to the Israelites mentioned above, there are another 70,000 that bear burdens and 80,000 that cut down trees. This is clearly a reference to the heavy work that needed to be done. Work done by non-Israelites. And then in verse 16, we see another 3,300 people said to be of Solomon's officers. They are not described as doing any manual labor. Scripture is clear to say that they were acting as supervisors, not laborers, supervisors. And to make things even more clear, we have a description in chapter 9 that distinguishes between those who serve the king under very reasonable conditions and those who must serve under conditions that are not compatible with those of a free man. So let's go there. 1 Kings 9, verses 19 through 22. The scripture reads, and all the cities of store that Solomon had, and cities for his chariots, and cities for his horsemen, and that which Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem and in Lebanon and in all the land of his dominion. And all the people that were left, listen, of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, which were not of the children of Israel. Their children that were left after them in the land, whom the children of Israel also were not able to utterly to destroy. Upon those did Solomon levy a tribute of bond service unto this day. But of the children of Israel did Solomon make no bondmen. But they were men of war, and his servants, and his princes, and his captains, and rulers of his chariots and horsemen. So here it is made clear. Those who could have claimed grievous labor were not Israelites. They were strangers in the land. They were defeated enemies. They were the ones that were subject to be bond servants, not Israelites. Yes, a small percentage of Israelites performed service for the king. Probably about 2% if you go by the numbers presented here. But they were soldiers, civil servants, rulers, supervisors, horsemen. And importantly, that group, well, they served under fair conditions. And they almost certainly received wages for their work. Bond servants don't get paychecks. So the complaints of Jeroboam and his delegation, as far as grievous burdens are concerned, seem to be substantially exaggerated. Now, of course, there is still the matter of taxes, and it is a certainty that the people were in fact subject to taxes. It appears that even though there was a great deal of wealth coming into the country and money was being made through commerce, etc., it still wasn't enough to completely offset the cost of Solomon's enormous building programs and to provide maintenance for his growing number of wives and all their needs and the overall size of his administration. 
So the people were required to pay taxes. But again, the charge was the grievous nature of those taxes. I have to conclude that those charges are only to be seen through crocodile tears. Here's the problem with taxes. No matter how necessary they are, people will still complain about them. And even if they're reasonable, people will still complain about them. It's a very old story, and it applies even in times of prosperity. People will focus on how much they are paying out without sufficient regard for how much they are keeping. And the real truth is that no matter how much we are paying, if what we are entitled to keep is providing us with a very comfortable lifestyle, we really shouldn't be complaining. Does this remind you of anyone? You think this problem is only found in the past? I think not. But I know we're talking about the days of Solomon, so for the time being, I'm going to try to stay there. Do you remember what the scriptures told us about the times of Solomon. What is it? What was it that characterized those days? Well, let's go back and read that revealing verse again. I'm talking about 1 Kings 4.20. So for the second time today, we'll read it. Verse 20, scripture reads, Judah and Israel were many, as the sand which is by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and making merry. The country was doing great. They were prosperous. They were all having babies, growing their families. And while they were doing it, they were eating and drinking and making merry. Did they have cause to complain that their taxes were grievous? No. But what do people usually do? They will invent a cause. You can just fill in the blank. In this case, it was a disingenuous complaint about their non-existent tax burden. We're paying too much. Were they? Doesn't appear so. But the older advisors to King Rehoboam in our example here determined that even though the complaints of the ten tribes were overblown, there was still room for the king to throw them a bone. They reasoned that the kingdom would still be all right if he reduced the taxes a little bit, that that would have been better than risking the total loss of all the revenue that was coming in from those tribes. And that's what Rehoboam should have done. But he didn't. Instead, he went the other way. And he promised to show this ungrateful group of people what a real burden looks like. He was going to raise the taxes. Of course, his plan backfired spectacularly, and he lost the loyalty of those ten tribes, just as God had prophesied. And they left. So that's the connection I wanted to make between 1 Kings 4.20 and 1 Kings chapter 12. A little caution for us in the areas of proper thankfulness. And on the other half, Rehoboam's side, recognizing good advice when you get it and the danger of unwarranted stubbornness. So Lord willing, next week, I want to follow up with King Solomon 
as the fame of his great wisdom begins to spread beyond the borders of Israel. Please remember to pray for all those on our prayer list. And until next time, Shalom.